great singing this morning. We appreciate that so much. Please take your Bible and turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Hebrews, chapter 11. Appreciate you being in God's house this morning. Appreciate the visitors. Good to see Lou up from Kentucky. And uh, we heard from uh, the Balls yesterday. They were sending their hellos up to uh, Calvary Baptist. They were sitting out on the porch and looking at deer. And so, uh, praising the Lord. Hebrews chapter 11. You know this chapter, it's the, the Hall of Faith, and it speaks about <clears throat> all of the saints of God and what they overcome through the power of God and how they were victorious and uh, so forth. And uh, they, they all get the victory. Praise God for that. You get the victory when you are in Christ Jesus. In the Hebrews chapter 11, after a long string of people that uh, win over all of the enemies by faith and what they've accomplished and what they've conquered and the Bible stories that you know and you've learned as children uh, like Gideon, you know, and like David and uh, Noah and, and all of those. And verse 36, it picks up with an interesting thought in Hebrews chapter 11 and in verse 36 it says, and others... And, and sometimes we're in the other category. Now, you win because you're in Christ. You're saved, born again, child of God. But uh, sometimes life is not uh, always like uh, uh, you and Samson picking up the jawbone of an ass and taking out all the enemy. And, uh, you know, sometimes it, it's not like that. Sometimes it's, it's more difficult, and life throws you some uh, curveballs and uh, some right hooks and some things you don't dodge and, and so forth. And it's always interesting where it says, and others. The Bible says, and others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment, like uh, being put in jail, like uh, the Apostle Paul but yet he could sing at midnight. Uh, tradition would have it that uh, Peter was crucified upside down. John on the Isle of Patmos, they said that, that he was boiled in a pot of oil. And so uh, they got the victory because they were in Christ, but they might be in that category of and others. The Bible says they were stoned, they were sawn asunder. It is said that uh, Isaiah was sawed and asunder. Were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Uh, John the Baptist, he ate wild honey and locusts. And uh, we're praising God that all the cicadas are about gone. But uh, that could have been a dietary portion for John the Baptist. Wouldn't be what I would want to eat. But uh, he, he came preaching a message that wasn't necessarily the most popular message. And to repent. And then to get baptized because they had repented. The Bible says that uh, of John the Baptist, he was preaching to the king at that time, got thrown in jail because the king had uh, married his uh, sister-in-law which you weren't allowed to do, think about today. And said because of that, that uh, there was a drunken brouhaha and the damsel that danced enticed him and asked uh, what uh, she would have. And she said, by and by the head of John the Baptist in a charger, nice girl. And they went and beheaded him. When you look at that, you understand that he was only about six months older than Jesus, and Jesus died on the cross about 33 and a half years of age, so John the Baptist died at an early age. He might be in others' category. But the Bible says that uh, this world <clears throat> was not worthy of them. Their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ 
Bible says, being tormented, in verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. Amen. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, <clears throat> thank you, dear God, for the word of God that we have just read. Please take the word and make it real in our hearts, applicable in our lives. Save the soul that is nearest hell. Strengthen the saint of God. And help us, dear Lord, as we look for your soon return, to be looking for you and laboring for you and loving you and loving others into the kingdom. We're praying that if there's one here today that's not saved, they'd get saved. And for the saint of God to get serious about serving you today. And dear Lord, we'll commit this time over to you, asking it in the name that is above every name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, there are those in Hebrews chapter 11 that are, are mentioned are mainly those of the, the Old Testament that trusted by faith. Often people say, how did people in the Old Testament get saved? They got saved by grace through faith, same as today. The everlasting gospel means that it's the everlasting gospel, that anybody that got saved at any time, it was all by grace through faith. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him or imputed unto him for righteousness. And uh, these are the Old Testament saints that uh, trusted by faith, but they were uh, looking ahead. They, they did all this because they looked past the now and now into the future. The Bible speaks of Abraham that he looked for a city whose foundations was of God. It was not made by hands. And so he was looking into the future at something better. He obeyed. And uh, they were looking past that. And the Bible says... And these all, verse 39, have obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. What, what is the promise that he's talking about? It's not that they did not receive the promise of heaven. They're in heaven. When they died, they went to heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so they are in heaven. It's not the promise of heaven. It's the promise of seeing the Messiah that was promised. They, they died before Jesus came to earth and died on the old rugged cross. That's what it's speaking about. And then the Bible says, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. And uh, so this morning, this message is on God has provided better things for us. And you can keep this in mind as we go through the message and then as we end. Who is meant by us? And then, number two, who are those without? You see it in that verse. The Bible says these three things that we'll base our thought on this morning. God having provided some better thing for us. And uh, in, in contrast to those that obtained good report through faith but received not the promise or did not see the Lord Jesus come and, and die on the old rugged cross. They, they died before that. But they were trusting in him through faith. The one who would come. And who are the us that they without us should not be made perfect. Who are those that are without? I want to say this in this thought of God has provided better things for us. Number one, I want to say this, that God has provided better things for us in that he has provided his son as our sacrifice. God has provided his son as our sacrifice. You notice this in Hebrews and in chapter 9. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 and in verse 22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. 
and without shedding of blood is no remission. Uh, there has always been the requirement of a blood sacrifice. From the time that sin entered into the world with Adam and Eve, the atonement for that sin required blood. It's always been required. Blood. Uh, somebody's blood has to be shed. And in the Old Testament economy, there was the innocent lamb that had to have the blood shed and brought and placed on the mercy seat for an atonement for one year or a covering at a time. Now, the Bible says in verse 23, it was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So what he's talking about is that the earthly tabernacle and uh, the sacrifices were a pattern of that in heaven. And in that earthly tabernacle, they brought a lamb. And they had to put it up and see that it was without blemish. They had to slit its throat, if you will, and gather the blood and catch the blood and, and place the blood on the, on the mercy seat and on the altar. And there was the uh, burnt sacrifice, the whole burnt offering. It all pictured Christ and what he would do. But the Bible says that uh, in the heavenly things with better sacrifices, and that's Jesus. Because the Bible says in verse 24, For Christ is not an enter, entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. So Jesus didn't bring his blood that was shed at the cross into the tabernacle that was made by hands on earth, but when he took the blood, he took it to the mercy seat in heaven. God has provided better things for us. He's provided His Son for our sacrifice. Verse 25 of Hebrews 9 says, Nor yet that He should offer Himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. So once a year the high priest went into the holy of holies behind the veil with the blood for himself and for others, to place it on the mercy seat. But the Bible says that Christ didn't do that often or week after week or mass after mass or none of that. The Bible says that he did it one time. Verse 26, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. God has provided better things for us in that he provided his son for our sacrifice. Verse 28, the Bible says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. What does that statement mean? The, the statement simply means that uh, this morning, if, if you are unsaved, if you've never been born again, if you've never been saved, then you have your sin nature that needs to be dealt with. If you've never been saved, if you've never been born again, you have a sin nature that if you die with, you're going to hell forever. You've been born with a sin nature. It was passed down to you from your uh, parents, Adam and Eve. For as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death has passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. If you're in the building and you've never been saved, then you're carrying your sin debt. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. That is separation from God for all of eternity, which will wind up in the lake of fire, which is the second death. But if you're in the building this morning and you realize that you're a sinner, that you've never been saved, then you can... Ask Jesus to come into your heart and save you from your sins. And then what that means is that your sin load will be taken off of you and placed on Jesus. Amen. Greatest theological truth this morning is that if you are a sinner that's not saved, God loves you, Jesus died for you, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
take that sin debt off you and place it on Jesus. And then his righteousness is imputed unto you. God has provided better things for us. He has provided his son for our sacrifice. He is the sinless son of God. The Bible says in Hebrews 7.26, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. That's Jesus. Jesus is the sinner's substitute. Who would you that I release unto you? Barabbas or Jesus? And they said, Barabbas. What shall we do with Jesus? Crucify him. Amen. And that's what happened for you, child that's of right, God. Right. You were Barabbas. I was Barabbas. I, I was guilty. You were guilty. There's Jesus, perfect, sinless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and Barabbas. Who gets to go free? Barabbas. Who dies? Jesus. Why? What evil has he done? Nothing. That's right. But he took your sin on him. Amen. And he wants to take your sin on him today. If you've never been saved, you need to get saved today. Amen. God has provided better things for us than that he's provided his son for our sacrifice. Number two, I want to say this very hurriedly. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, as it says, and others, God has provided better things for us. God has provided His Son for our sacrifice. Number two, God has provided His promise for our salvation. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, if you notice this, God has uh, provided a promise for our salvation. In Acts chapter 4, and in verse 12, the Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other. Neither is there salvation in any other person, place, thing, means, methods, religion. For there is none other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. You must be saved. If you're going to go to heaven, you must be saved. If you're going to escape hell, you must be saved. If you're going to be a Christian, you must be saved. And there is a promise from the Word of God that if you come to Him, He will not cast you out. The Bible says in John 6, 37, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. You say, am I one of those? If you would come... How can I know if I'm one that the Father gives to Jesus? If you come. If you would simply just come. If you come unto the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says in the verse, all that come to me, I will in no wise cast out. H how do I know if I'm one? Just come. Look and live. Look to Jesus. Looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God the Father. How do I know if I'm one? Come. Come unto me, all ye that labor are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There's the absolute promise of salvation. Better. God has provided better for you this morning, child of God. He's got the promise of salvation if you come this morning. He promises to save you. God has provided better things for us. He's provided, provided His Son for our sacrifice. Uh, there has to be blood shed. For the ways of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's promised us His salvation. I understand that not all will be saved. But I do know from the Bible all can be saved. Anybody who wants to be saved can be saved. The Bible says in Hebrews 7, 25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost. You've not reached a new low that God will save you. You're not too good that you don't need saved, and you're not too bad that you can't be saved. You can be saved this morning. They come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for him. The Lord is not slack 
Concerning his promise, the Bible says, as some men cast likeness, but as long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I want you to remember this verse, saved or lost this morning, in Romans chapter 10, as we witness to an elderly gentleman yesterday. In Romans chapter 10, we wanted to say that he just would not believe would not believe. It's, it's a matter of your will. The Bible says in Romans 10 13, the Bible says this. I want you to get this. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's exclusive and it's inclusive. You put your name in the whosoever will. God will save you. But it's exclusive, dependent upon you do the calling. If you do the calling, God will do the saving. I beg you this morning, if, if you're not saved, you get saved. Now this morning. Because God has provided better things for us. His son for our sacrifice, his promise of our salvation. Number three, and hurriedly, his word for our scriptures. You've got God's word on it. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.15, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. You've got his word for our scriptures. The scriptures, the Bible is inspired. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It's inspired. It is also preserved in Psalms 12, uh, verses 6 and 7. You've got God's word on it. In Psalm chapter 12, and in verse 6 and 7, the same God that inspired the word of God over 16 hundred years of, of, of time frame with 400 years of silence in between from the closing of the Old Testament with the book of Malachi to the opening of the New Testament 400 years of silence with one red thread running through it all the blood of Jesus the promise of salvation 1600 years 40 human penmen one Holy Spirit of God It's inspired of God. The same God that inspired it preserves it for you. The Bible says in, in Psalm chapter 12, verse 6, the words, not just the thoughts, the words of the Lord are pure words, a silver tried in a furnace of fire, of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. We have his word for our scriptures. I want to say they are inspired of God, they're preserved by God, and they are complete. Matthew 4, 4, the Bible says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It is complete. There is a warning, don't add to it. There is a warning, don't take away from it. The word of God is complete. There's no new revelation. You have the completed canon of Scripture. You have the completed word of God. John 17, 17, in the high priestly prayer of our Lord Jesus, he said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You've got the completed word of God. God has provided better things for us. Number four, I want to say this. His spirit for our security. His spirit for our security. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, if you notice this, Galatians, Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 13. In whom ye also trusted. That's Christ, the person of Christ. After that you heard the word of truth, you see the Bible, the scriptures, the gospel of your salvation, that's the good news, the death, burial, and resurrection. In whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. God has provided better things for us. His son for our sacrifice. His promise of our salvation. His word for our scriptures. And 
his spirit for our security, sealed until the day of redemption. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. The Bible says in John 14, 17, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I'll not leave you comfortless. God has provided better things for us. His Son for our sacrifice. You don't have to offer your blood. It wouldn't do. You can die in your sins unregenerate and pay for your sins forever in a place called hell, but you don't have to. Because he's provided his son for our sacrifice. He's provided his promise of salvation. If you'll come, he'll save you. He's, provi he, he's provided his word for our scriptures to help you on your sojourn on your way home. He has provided his spirit for our security. You don't have to walk around on eggshells and wonder if you're saved or not. If you've been saved, you are saved. And if you're not saved, you need to get saved. But if you are, you've got that security. Number five, and very quickly uh, this morning, I said God has provided better things for us. He's provided a church for your service. God's given you a church. It's Matthew 16, 18, where the Bible says, Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Christ is the head of the church, the New Testament church, that in all things he would have the preeminence in your church. The message of the church is preaching Christ. Assembly is necessary. And serving in the local church is a fundamental truth of the Word of God. He's given you a church for our service. How, how are you in your fellowship uh, with the church? I'll say this very quickly. If you go to John chapter 14, God has provided better things for us his son for our sacrifice, his promise of our salvation, his word for our scriptures, his spirit for our security, his church for our service, and his place for all that are saved. His place is better than our place. And he's provided his place for the child of God. The saint of God has got the guarantee of heaven and being in the place that God's making for you. In John chapter 14, the Bible says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are any mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. God's place is better than your place. God's place is better than any place, and God is preparing that place for you if you're saved. If you're a saint of God, Jesus is preparing a place for you. It's a mansion in glory, verse 2. It's a reward, the presence of Jesus. And it is a rest from all of your labors. Revelation 14, 13, the Bible says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. And their works do follow them. Praise God when we get to heaven, child of God, the labor's over. They'll be serving of the Lord, but the labor's over and it'll be rest. <coughs> His place for all the saved. I'll end on this. God has provided a place for us. God has provided better things for us. His son for our sacrifice, his promise of our salvation, his word for our scriptures, his spirit for our security, his church for our service, his place for all the saved. But then there is also this, without being unbiblical, I have to tell you that he's also provided his punishment for all sinners. One of the joys of heaven is what will not be in heaven. Notice this. If you go to Revelation and I'll end. Revelation chapter 14. In Revelation chapter 14, he's provided his punishment for all sinners. 
I'm talking about the individual who will not get saved. Not cannot, will not. In Revelation chapter 14 and verse 11, the Bible says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receives the mark of his image. There's no rest. There, there's no rest for the individual who is not saved. If you're in the building and you're not saved, when you die, you're going to automatically go to hell. Just as a saved person automatically goes to heaven. If you're in the building and you're not saved, when you die, you're going to hell. And that's what the Bible says. And I don't preach it and speak it glad of it. I speak it and preach it in fear and trembling. Because the Bible is true that there is a punishment for all sinners. All who will not get saved. Whether you believe it, you don't believe it, the Bible says that all unbelievers will die in their sins and go to the devil's hell. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11, the Bible says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth uh, and, and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them no place for them. Like the saint gets a place in heaven. And a songwriter said, I, I, give me a place somewhere next to Jesus. And death is separation. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Separation from God for all of eternity. There's the punishment for those that will not get saved, who will not get saved. In Revelation 21 and verse 8, the Bible says that there is a group of people who are overcome. And the Bible says, but they're fearful and unbelieving, the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You think bad people go to hell. No, just unbelievers. Unregenerate. Put it off. I'm as good as the next person. I've never done that. My good and bad will be weighed out and so forth. I mow my grass. I pay my taxes. I pay my bills and so forth. Fearful, unbelieving, and abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burneth with fire and brimstone. And that's forever. Verse 27, the Bible says, same chapter. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Won't enter into the city, New Jerusalem. Won't enter into heaven. Neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie. But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Chapter 22 and verse 15. The Bible says, For without, or outside the gates, outside of heaven, are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. That's what's not in heaven. If you're in the building and you're not saved, you do not have to die and go to hell. Why? Because God has provided better things for us. Who are those us? Who, who's the us? A Christian. A saved, born again, child of God. None of us are perfect. I understand that. But you're covered by the blood. You've accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Who are those that are without? Those who are without Christ. Those who are without Christ. You, you've never accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. By childlike faith, there's an opportunity for you this morning. We're going to give an invitation. The invitation this morning is that, number one, would you believe the Bible says you're a sinner? 
For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You say, I'm better than you, preacher. I know that. I know you are. But do you believe that you're, uh, you've come short of the glory of God? Do you believe you're a sinner? If you can get past that, say, I believe that I'm a sinner. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay your sin debt? The Bible says Jesus died on the cross to pay your sin debt. Do you believe that? If you believe that you're a sinner and that Jesus died on the cross to pay your sin debt, would you this morning ask Jesus to come into your heart and save you from your sins? That's the invitation this morning. If you want to be saved this morning, God loves you. Jesus died for you. Whosoever shall call upon them, Lord, shall be saved. If you're in the building this morning, you've been saved, you're scripturally baptized, you're part of an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing church, would you accept the fact that Jesus gave you the church for you to serve him in? And one day you'll be glad that you did. With every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around. I just simply want to ask you, this morning, if you do not know for sure heaven is your home, if you don't know that if you die today you'd go to heaven, uh, why don't you come this morning allow us to take the word of God and show you how that you can know for sure heaven is your home. Uh, if you need to get saved this morning, uh, why don't you come? If you're in the building and you're saved, but uh, you're not quite serving the Lord as you should, uh, get it right with God this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask, dear God, that you would forgive me of my sins, fill me with thy spirit. And dear Lord, that you would take the message that was uh, preached and finish it, make it real to people's hearts, allow them to know that uh, we love them, but you love them. And that you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If there's somebody in the building that's not saved, we pray they'll get saved. We offer this opportunity to come. For everybody that is saved, dear Lord, that uh, you would examine their hearts. They would ask you to examine their hearts and show them where they are in the service for the Lord. Help us, dear Lord, and strengthen us. Please help this church. Please help this people. Most of all, uh, please save the soul that is not saved. Commit this time of invitation over to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.